And hi, everyone. I'm Rachel O'Mara. I'm really excited today uh, to be hosting an Authors at Google event, Talks at Google. Uh, we have Marianne Williamson here today, and she's here to talk about her latest work, how to overcome financial stress and live a, a life of abundance. Uh, Marianne, if you aren't familiar with her work, is one of our greatest spiritual leaders right now, motivator, uh, le lecturer, in general, someone who is making a big difference in the world. So uh, if anyone here is familiar with her work, uh, that's awesome. And if not, hopefully you'll come away from today learning a few, a few things about how you can live a life of abundance. Uh, her latest book, it's called The Law of Divine Compensation, is available in the back. And uh, Return to Love, which is one of her earlier works, is also available in the back. And uh, I'll, I'll just leave with this comment. Um, you know, I think it's really important at Google that we bring in authors that challenge what we think and speakers who have open agendas and really just make a difference in our culture at Google to really be pushing the envelope and figuring out what's best, what we can do, and how we can help. So Marianne is here for that reason today. And if anyone saw the movie Coach Carter, she has a quote in there that I really enjoy and I wanted to share with you before we get started. So what is in the movie is the following. And this is Marianne's quote. Our deepest fear is that is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. So with that, I'll leave you with Marianne. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, I tell you, I forgot that I had uh, told Rachel I would be talking about uh, abundance and financial stress. We'll get there, because uh, I'm going <laughs> to instead go with what, since apparently I wrote that email, uh, I've been thinking about that I want to share with you. But as you'll also uh, recognize, it's all one big conversation uh, anyway. So let's start with this conversation about creativity and leadership. Creativity, the way the Western mind usually thinks of creating something, we think of ourselves as being generative. We think, I need to go create something. Certainly at a company like this, you're thinking about that a lot. We've got to create something. We've got to create something. Now, a lot of this has to do with, you could talk about it as a worldly perspective versus a more spiritual perspective. In a very real way, it's a more Western perspective rather than an Eastern perspective. The idea of creativity being generative is a very Western concept. It's like the thought that if you bring a, um, uh, you bring a blank document uh, up on your screen and you've got to figure out what to write on it. What am I going to create on this, on this, uh, uh, on this document? A more spiritual or metaphysical perspective says there's already a file. And your job is to download the file. And it is an undeletable file. And it is creativity itself. You know, Hemingway was famous for having talked about how unless the story was writing itself, he put the pencil down. He would write, he said, every day for as long a period of time as the story seemed to be writing itself through him. Once he felt that that was no longer happening, he put the pencil down. And of course, in the, that fabulous uh, book, uh, Letters to a Young Poet, the poet Rilke, uh, when asked by the young poet, how do I know if I should be a poet even? Rilke's response was, only be a poet if you have to. Only if it is the calling that is within you that is undeniable. Also, in the Eastern religions, in Zen Buddhism, of course, whereas in the Western mind, we think of learning everything I need to learn so that then I can make something happen. The highest creative moment in Zen Buddhism is emp the empty mind. The Zen mind in Buddhism is called the beginner's mind. So it, the practice of the East, or the practice of spirituality, is to take everything, all, all that you've learned you learn it just so that you, then you can forget it. Now, it's still there. So that's not a reason to not become educated. It's not a reason to not read the books and get the skill set. But the practice of the creative mind is to enter into the moment without that clutter. In the I Ching, they talk about presenting an empty rice bowl to God an empty rice bowl. Now, it's the same thing, the idea of an empty rice bowl, because it's said in the East that the Tao will fill the rice bowl. But if you enter 
<clears throat> in uh, the moment thinking you already know, then that higher force of creativity, by whatever you call it, cannot work through you. It does actually have a, a, have a corresponding um, uh, metaphysical principle in the New Testament uh, when Jesus said, be as little children. Because in the Course in Miracles, he says what that means is little children know that they do not know. And so they are teachable. Where adults too often walk into a situation thinking that they do know, and so they're not teachable. Which I think, by the way, is even more of a psychic crisis for males than females in our society. Because men are so bred, we're all embarrassed to, to say that we don't know. But men particularly, it's almost like a, they must act like they know. Um, and this, that particular aspect of, of the mind is actually very det detrimental to us because the, the mind that thinks it knows is not the mind that ultimately knows. Because the mind that ultimately knows is the mind that, as it were, is receptive to a higher vibration of knowledge. Now, leadership fits in to that because, you know, in the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu said, to be a follower, the way to be a leader of men is to be a follower of the Tao. So if you think of yourself, it's counterintuitive. If you're thinking of yourself as here to follow something higher, you manifest as a leader among other people. If you act like someone who's trying to be a leader, people kind of wonder what your game is. <laughs> because like, what are you trying to do? Because particularly today, with this switch over out of the top-down model, we're moving into the idea, we have moved into the idea, of leadership as someone who holds a space for the brilliance of others. Now, if that's what leadership is. Leadership is that I hold the space, I assume you're brilliant. That's the, the best thing, if you're a leader on a team, the best thing you can do is to assume that everybody there is a genius. Now, the notion metaphysically is that all minds are joined that on a level of energy and mind, there's really no place where you stop and I start. Everybody subconsciously knows everything. If I'm sitting in a room with you, this goes way beyond behavior modification, because if I'm sitting with a room, in a room with you, no matter how nice I'm being to you, if I really assume you have some real limits, you know that on some level whether you even consciously know it or not. But if I'm assuming that you, like everyone, has only scratched the surface of genius that lies inside all of us, that is, that is the word salute. That's what salute means. I salute you. I recognize that, recognize that in you. And in my presence, it's kind of like when you go to therapy, and you, you might be at a therapeutic session, and at the end of the session, you say to your therapist, oh, thank you, thank you, this was so good for me, thank you. The therapist had hardly said a word. <laughs> you ever had those times? It was the quality of their compassion and non-judgment. In the presence, that's what their skill set was. The quality of their compassion and non-judgment called you. And so if a leader is simply assuming that you're a genius, assuming that you, genius lies within you, that you have the potential for greatness, it literally, in the presence of that person who is assuming the best in you, is it, you, you will rise to that level. Now, once again, I wasn't seeking to lead you. I was seeking to follow an inner light. Now, you can, you can talk about that inner light or inner understanding in secular terms or religious terms, spiritual terms. terms from, it, it's, it's so irrelevant, the language that we use. The point is that we're beginning to understand that there are, what do they say, we use 10% of the brain cells, that there are expanded dimensions of consciousness. And that when we enter into those dimensions of consciousness, whether it's through meditation, mindfulness, which is like the politically correct way of expressing meditation today, uh, prayer, whatever our practice is, the idea is that we literally, it's a conversion. It's just like converting in electricity. You're converting into the wisdom mind. You're converting out of the strategic mind. You're turning out of, converting out of the formulaic mind. And this is what people are, finally beginning to understand. When you're converting out of the rational or beyond the rational, you're not going into the irrational, you're just going into the non-rational. The non-rational is not irrational. Look at nature. Look at nature. Look at how nature always takes care of its young. Right? What is rational about a society of geniuses 
that spends so much more effort on keeping people down, harming people we don't like, incarcerating them if they mess up. What's rational about this? It is insane. So if you get a bunch of rational, so-called rational people together who do not have a sense of serving a higher good, you come up with irrational, irrational actions and irrational behavior. And that is where we have come to in our society and in our civilization, even when you look at something like technology. Um, technology, uh, the idea of the material plane from a spiritual perspective is that there's nothing on the spiritual plane that is either holy or unholy, high-minded or, or low-minded, except, uh, except as the mind ascribes purpose to it. Nobody needs to be reminded in this room uh, the incredibly good things that technology can do for the world. But nobody needs to be reminded in this room either the very destructive ways that people can use technology as well. This is where Western civilization particularly is. This is where we are. We have all this, but the crisis now is the crisis of significance and the crisis of importance. And will we use what we have done uh, in our society over the last 40 years or so uh, is that we have taken the prodigious genius and education and capacity of, a, of generations of Americans, the most privileged in a very long time, and used it primarily for unimportant ends. And there are a lot of sociological and political reasons for that. But the analysis of how we got here is not as important as that we start anew. And in starting anew, we're really moving out. Many people are moving out of the sense of, I don't know, I'll do whatever I want to do. Now, the I don't know, I'll do whatever I want to do, you know, when you look at the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages was dominated by a church structure that was imprisoning and limiting to the mind. And it had a particular worldview, and anybody who didn't toe the line with that worldview was cast out at best and tortured and killed at worst. The Enlightenment, the 18th century Enlightenment was so important, and this country was founded in it. It, uh, of it. It was the idea of, no, the human being of themselves, without a church sitting on top of them, can use reason and can do whatever they want. But you know, Hegel said it's thesis, antithesis, synthesis, because now we realize we have taken what is really a positive characterological image of the rugged individualist, and we've taken it so far that now we're like the cancer cell, which has gone insane. And instead of recognizing its natural intelligence, which would lead it to collaborate with other cells for the healthy functioning of the organ, the cancer cell is a cell that says, I don't want to do that. I want to go do my own thing. I, I don't want to just collaborate with other cells to serve the healthy functioning of the spleen. I want to go do my own thing. And that is malignant. And it just gathers other sick cells around it. That forms a mass, which is then destructive not only to that organ, but to the entire system and ultimately to itself. And that is where the Western mind has gone. And individualist mentality has become malignant mentality. It's one thing to be an individual and to know that I am a unique expression, as all of us are. That's a beautiful thing. But even the, the, the rose knows it's part of a larger garden. The, you, know, you have the rose, and you have the tulip, and you have the peony, and you have the daisy, and all that. But then there's this thing called the garden, and they all belong within the garden. The malignant thinking of Western consciousness is that we have thought, it's just about me. We have put competition above collaboration. We have forgotten that there's a bigger purpose here than just me getting what I want. So I think that's this era of history that we're in, because we realize, uh, and I think that there is an awakening in, in our society, and I think around the world, of people recognizing that whatever mentality has been dominating things has taken us uh, literally, not figuratively, literally to the brink of disaster. Literally. Uh, we, there are so many stress points. There are so many very, very grim probability vectors for the next 20 years. And I think that all that's, uh, uh, I wouldn't say all that's needed, but the, really the primary foundational thing that's needed is that shift in thinking from, I, I don't have these toys. I mean, you hear, if this were um, something happening in, centuries ago, Google would be seen as a, a wizard school, like, like, like Hogwarts. You, you are carrying, this is wizardry. This is what would have been called wizardry. But the issue that you would see if it was, if it was centuries ago, there would be a conversation, is it the dark arts or the light arts? And I think the blessing on a company like this from a metaphysical perspective 
is that there already is the conversation, we want to make people's, people's lives better. But even that, I think the next iteration is beyond making just individuals' lives better. How are we going to keep this ship that we're on from hitting the iceberg? Now, uh, Rachel mentioned my last book, The Law of Divine Compensation. So in that, I talk about a principle I want to move into now. From a metaphysical perspective, and meta means beyond, so there's the physical, as above, so below. The notion is that there are objective, discernible laws of the internal uh, realms of consciousness, just as there are objective, discernible laws of the external world. Uh, gravity, thermodynamics, same with the internal phenomenon. Nothing in this world, even the mysteries, are not mysterious if you understand them. The notion of a self-organizing universe is that you see certain imprints in nature. The embryo, the way it becomes a baby. The bud, the way it becomes a blossom. The acorn, the way it becomes an oak tree. A little acorn is programmed within. A little acorn is already carrying a blueprint by which it will one day turn into an oak tree, a huge oak tree. The embryo, you have one sperm, you have one egg, and even though we can make pictures of it, the mystery by which it is programmed, somehow those cells are going to divide and become a brain, and become a heart, and become lungs and become eyeballs, and become skull, and become hair, and become skin, and become a vascular system. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. And it's going to be put in this tiny little package to come out through a woman's legs. I mean, the whole thing is a level of genius that is so beyond anything that we have come up with. The metaphysical notion is that it is not just the cells in an embryo becoming a baby. It is not just the bud becoming a blossom or the acorn becoming the oak tree, but that every single aspect of nature, there is an imprint of self-organization. Not only self-organization, but self-correction. What that means is, just as the cell is programmed, its own native intelligence, when it is sane, we've already talked about an insane cell is called a cancer cell, but a sane cell is recognizing its natural programming by which it collaborates with the other cells to serve the healthy functioning. From a metaphysical perspective, you and I are all cells, also naturally programmed to collaborate with others in order to serve the healthy functioning of the total organism, which is life on the planet as we know it. We have been taught an insane perspective, and that's what Gandhi said, the problem with the world is humanity is out of his mind. So when we are not thinking, how can I serve, we are insane. And when we do think, how can I serve, it literally performs a conversion in the brain. So if you go into any meeting, you know, and this is what, you know, I, I love what's happening in the world today because the, what, what people are doing today is that they're casting on to what I'm about to say, it's woo-woo, but actually ripping it off and turning it into all kinds of, of leadership seminars and stuff like that and saying, but we're not woo-woo, when actually they're saying the exact, thing that, the exact same thing that the people they call woo-woo were saying. This projection onto love and spirituality, it's just woo-woo, it's light brain, it's fuzzy brain thinking, as though, like I said, it's really intelligent to just incarcerate everybody that acts out out of their desperation or bomb people who dare to, who, to dare to disagree with you, right? As though that's really sane. But the idea here is that when your attitude, your perspective, is before you walk into a meeting that you just send your peace to everybody who's going to be there. You send your love before you. For some people it's saying a prayer, for some people it's blessing, for some people it's just sending peace, sending Good energy, wishing you the best, beneficent, namaste. That's another thing with Americans. If we say it in another language, we'll accept it. <laughs> Particularly in Northern California. Right? <clears throat> Fine, whatever. Whatever it does it for you. I, the, the love in me salutes the love in you. The Christ in me salutes Christ. And God in me salutes God in you. <coughs> Buddha within me salutes the Buddha in you. It truly does not matter. It's that the wisdom in me and the love in me and the goodness in me. You will literally have a different meeting. And what it does is it plugs everybody into their natural intelligence. Now the idea of the law of divine compensation is not only is the universe self-organizing, which means just as every, every cell in the embryo is already programmed to turn into the baby, that perspective holds that you and I are already programmed, each and every one of us, to become fully self-actualized. The oak tree is the full self-actualization of the, of the um, 
of the uh, acorn, mm -hmm. and the blossom is the full self-actualization of the bud, and the baby is the full self-actualization of the embryo, the person you're capable of being is your self-actualized self, and you are programmed to be the man or the woman that you are capable of being on this planet this lifetime, no less than the embryo is, cap is programmed to be the baby. But the difference with, between us and the, the acorn and the embryo is that you and I can say, no, I don't want to. That's what free will means. I don't have to. I don't have to think the thoughts of complete service and compassion and love. I can say, no, I'm only here for myself. I'm only here to get something. And I have an idea of what I need to make happen, which is always based on something that happened in my past that I need to compensate for. That's why I think I need to make it happen. Therefore, my core belief is that things really aren't good enough already. Therefore, no matter what I do, I will recreate a situation in which things are not good enough already. So the attitude of, I'm only here to love, is hardly woo-woo thinking. It's the most sophisticated thinking. I have no agenda. I'm empty. How can, I, how can I serve? Wow, you're incredible. And dear God, if there's any part of me that can't see how incredible she is, please move, remove that obstruction in whatever language. And then you're in a, you're, you are literally in a parallel universe of possibility. And that's what's happening on the planet, I think, is that we are seeking some in religious and spiritual ways and some in secular ways to return to that natural intelligence, whether it's through mindfulness, whether it's through meditation, whether it's through spiritual practice, and even more importantly, that we remember that when you do meditate, when you do align yourself with these kinds of ideas, the point is not just to be there while you're doing your practice. It's what happens when you open your eyes, you go back into the world, so that if I'm in a business meeting with you, I'm looking at you thinking, the love in me salutes the love in you. If, if I'm in a, in, a, in a business meeting with you, I'm thinking, wow, uh, boy, my judgments are really high. That's blocking the possibilities that could happen here. I'm really willing to see this differently. You train your brain. You train your mind into a different perspective. The universe is self-organizing, yes, it's also self-correcting. And that means that just like once that baby, once the embryo turns into the baby, once the body is born, and the lungs continue to breathe and the heart continues to beat, the body also has an immune system. So that if injury or illness enters into the system, the immune system is there to take care of the problem. We also, the psychic bloodstream as it were of humanity, we also have an immune system. An immune system takes the form of conscience, remorse, moral concern, and so forth. That's why it's such a conversation in the society about sociopaths. Sociopaths and narcissists, they're cancerous cells. It's a malignant mentality because it's only concerned for self. There's a lot of talk in society today, don't feel bad. With some people in some situations, feel bad. Because <laughs> only a sociopath would not feel bad in this moment. Conscience has a, has a, has a reason, has a, ha, ha, is there for a reason. Remorse is there for a reason. Nature provides us with these things as a, as a way of ringing red, you know, red, bells are ringing and lights are flashing. No, it's not okay. It's not okay that 17,000 children are starving on this planet every day. It's not okay. It's not okay that America has 2.4 million people incarcerated, that there are more African American men incarcerated today than there were enslaved in 1850. It's not okay. It's not okay that one in four American children are food insecure. It's not okay. That's not something that a, uh, you know, that's not something that, that a Google thing is going to come up on your computer and say, it's not OK, it's not OK. But if you say it's not OK, then when you consider the wizardry of things like Google and the extraordinary technological advances that have come about, then we can handle all those problems. And that's why a place like this is so important. I heard a man say not too long ago, he's a medical doctor. And he was dealing with these extraordinary machines that are doing all the stuff with the stem cells and the genome. And I mean, it's just amazing what medical research is coming up with. But he was talking about the irony, and he's so right. The work we do to save one life, and then we so casually destroy many. That is an insanity factor. And no machine can fix that. But when we allow our hearts and minds to be aligned and we become deeply rational, there's a line in the Course in Miracles where it says, love restores reason and not the other way around. And we see that all the technological and material resources, such as a Google, 
such as technology, are here to be used in service to that, then there's nothing that we cannot do. Now, the issue of, 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 of abundance is that that is the abundance. That is the abundance. This mentality is the abundance. And you, when you are living in that internal abundance, uh, Martin Luther King said, you are surrounded by cosmic companionship. When you're just trying to make things happen, you're not creating anything, you're making something. You're staying on the mortal plane, and you're at the effect, and will be, continue to be at the effect of the laws of chaos and randomness and good luck. And I hope you do well. When you convert to, I'm here, no more and no less, than any other human being for purposes much greater than my mortal mind has any idea. I carry within me, no more and no less, infinite potential for brilliance and genius. I am programmed no more and no less than every other person to be the highest actualization of my possibility on this planet, manifest creatively in this lifetime. And that as I do that, I will naturally, just as cells find themselves in the presence of other cells who know to collaborate with them to do what they do for the healthy functioning of the body, to the extent that I'm living at that higher frequency of possibility, I will then naturally resonate with people who are also playing the higher game. And we are all programmed, not necessarily through what our rational mind can determine, but through our hearts with the rational mind in service to that. And then not only do we actualize, but we become a huge corrective force for a planet that is absolutely in trouble. Uh, many years ago, I was, when I was a teenager, I was accosted in my house, a man who um, uh, broke into my parents' home. And when this happened, and I was in my bedroom, and he came in the door, I had an experience where every cell was alive. Every cell was alive. And I really had an experience how the human is programmed when there is real disaster. Every cell of me was alive. I was catapulted into behavior, and, and th th what 17-year-old girl even knows, right? And I think that that's what's happening on this planet. I, f I feel it. There's a quickening. I used to think, just God, we would all say, you know, Americans are so asleep. I don't think we're asleep anymore. I, I think there's a critical mass. There's enough people who, like, get, you know, the, it's, it's like storm warnings. And now, for us to remember, we are programmed to be able to handle this. An immune system knows what to do. And AIDS was a fascinating metaphysical, just as cancer is a fascinating representation of where consciousness has gone off, so is an, a suppressed immune system. We have forgotten we're the immune system. And when we see ourselves that way, and just have that action within, it sparks something. It sparks something in the heart, and it sparks something in the brain, and it makes other people perceive us differently. Then what will happen, I think, is that we'll get going. And there is no doubt. I think we've already started. I just think we need to step it up. And uh, obviously, uh, companies like this, and anything that has to do with technology, is uh, part of what not only can go right in individuals' lives, uh, but can be used in a collective way beyond anything you've even come up with yet to turn the ship around so that collectively we, we do more than we're doing now. What we're doing now is that one force of people and forces in America seem determined to just throw us over the cliff. Another force is trying hard to keep us from the cliff. What we need to do is just walk in a different direction entirely. And the universe is not only organized and knows how to organize, and it is self-organizing, but within the infinity of spiritual substance, there's also the capacity to compensate for any lack or any problem when it exists. And that divine compensation not only makes sure that you personally are taken care of, uh, but something much more important happens uh, than just that you are financially and career-wise taken care of. And that's that we become a generation that saves um, the entire species from global catastrophe, which it is absolutely not unreasonable to consider possible, if not probable, at this time. Does that make sense? Okay. So what I'd like to do, since there's a microphone right there, uh, what I'd like to do at the time we have left is for anybody who wants to, to come to the mic to either bring up, a, uh, bring up a, uh, a topic or ask a question within this, and uh, we'll talk about it. You know, from a spiritual perspective, this idea of the shift, the conversion, the shift from fear to love, is nothing short of a miracle. 
because that miracle has to do with a reprogramming of thought system so that possibilities exist within time and space that would otherwise have not existed. Uh -huh. So thank you for all of, the, uh, all of that great insight. For folks who are looking to start that conversation, like you said, mm -hmm. here at Google, we've got a lot of analytical minds and mm -hmm. outside of Google there's just all types of folks, right? So how do you just start it? If there's a question that maybe you know others that might be interested or even not even close to where this is right now, what you're talking about, they're just not in that mindset. Can you give us some tips on how would you start okay, that? Okay, now this is, what, this is what's interesting here. Self-organizing universe, each of us are cells, so each of us has natural intelligence. Each of us has a part to play, like every cell in the body has a part to play. Not only does it have its part to play, but no other cell has that part. So that's true of each of us. Now, no cell says to the other cell, I, th I know what you should do. Because the guidance for every cell comes to that cell. You start with the idea that wherever you are, that's it. Every situation you're in, whoever you're talking to, whatever the circumstance, if you're just standing there, there to be of service, there to be empty, <clears throat> there to be of service, there to not have an agenda, you know, because that's what we've done in our society. You know, you, you're, you're taught that the way to really handle a business meeting is to go in beforehand, what's your intention, what's the result you want, which is, sounds so lovely, it's so dark. Because it really means, how can I exploit you? How, do I, how can I control you? How can I manipulate you? And how can I use you to get what I want? It has termed human interaction transactional. There's nothing beautiful about that. There's nothing enlightened about that. So instead, we walk into any situation. And remember, I'm not trying to generate anything. Creativity, the intelligence, the higher intelligence of the universe, knows exactly how you and I meeting in this conversation can best be used how it fits into you learning what you need to learn, how it fits into me learning what I need to learn. If you and I trigger each other, that's no less, by the way. All I need to know is that this situation is an invitation to me to rise to the highest version of myself that I can be, to be kind, to just be available, to be in the present with you. And then life will take us wherever would best serve, right? And literally, it comes out of, quote unquote, left field. Right? Out of, out of the blue. When people say, I just met him out of the blue. We just happen to be talking. When you live that way and you see it and things just happen, that's why it is Hogwarts. It is. It's like, oh, just what I needed just happened to be there. Why? Because I wasn't trying to make something happen. I, she and I were just, were just talking and, and being kind and compassionate, really caring about each other. And next thing I know, you, who is exactly what we needed, just happened to be sitting there. The chaotic universe is the one that occurs, OK, now what is it we need? And how can we get it? And who can we find? I mean, there's an aspect of that if it's of service to the higher. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I, it's none of my business what any of you are supposed to do. It's none of your business what I'm supposed to do. All we're talking about is showing up in any room you happen to be in, knowing that the universe, whenever anybody's consciousness is, how can I serve and I'm available today, use me, use my hands, use my feet, and it goes without saying, the universe can use smart people. A lot of them. Necessary. Now. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Hello. <laughs> yes. I often find myself being um, conflicted um, when a thought comes to my mind that say I need to serve, for example, animals. <clears throat> serve what? Animals. Animals, yeah. Or any, any cause for okay. that matter. Okay. The thought that comes to my mind is that A, yes, you are trying to be present and you're working on yourself. Right. Is this a calling that's coming from that truth or higher self or whatever you might want to call it? Or is it just your mind, your smart cell in your mind just saying, just presenting you another way of fulfilling, feeling fulfilled, you know? So for instance, <clears throat> the thought might say, okay, you need to, you really like helping animals, so you should do it. But then another thought comes that that could also be an egoic thing. How do you know it's coming from your true self, or is it your you know, purpose, it's like love you said? For another, it's love and the end of suffering for another sentient being. Yeah. The ego does not want you to give yourself to love and the diminishment of suffering of other sentient beings. 
any voice that is leading you to love and the end of suffering for other sentient beings is the voice of spirit. Now, if you have some egoic motivations around it, like, oh, those people will like me if I do that, then you check that. But the impulse, and, and by the way, I want to say this. You have now been in a room where for 30 minutes we've spoken these kinds of ideas. It's very difficult to lie to yourself. When you're in a room, ideas grow stronger when being shared. This is a good time to listen to yourself. You said serving animals three times. Yes, that's what your heart is leading you to do. That's your assignment. We all have different assignments. Some cells are supposed to be working on the spleen, some on the liver, some on the heart. Your assignment is animal. Somebody else's assignment is the environment. Somebody else's uh, assignment is uh, sex trafficking. Somebody else's assignment is hunger and poverty. Somebody else's assignment is. Because every cell is directed to go where it could be best of use. And also, that's helpful. And also, if you could talk about, you know, a lot of texts in different ways say that no matter what action you do, it doesn't matter. It all comes down to, again, the consciousness with which you do it. So irrespective of whether I do this or not, mm -hmm. should I mm -hmm. be always be centered Only around that? Only an entitled, narcissistic era of Americans could say such a thing. 17,000 children on this planet starve to death every day. In addition to that, there are 15,000 adults who are dying. There are a billion people living on this planet on a dollar and a half and less a day. There are a billion above that living on two dollars and less a day. This is why the world looks at us and can't figure out what we're thinking. It doesn't matter what we do. Yeah, that's real easy for us to say here, isn't it? Because we're all pretty much making it. See, that's the thing. The club in America and in most of Western civilization, if you're in the club, it's a great place. <laughs> I love the club. The club's been good to me. Not enough people can get into the club these days. And some of the things that are happening outside the club are genuinely horrific. So the last thing that we need to be saying to ourselves or to each other is that what we do doesn't really matter as long as we have what? Loving intention? What does that even mean? And there are people getting paid to say that. What, I can, what? How easy can it get? Oh, that's cool. I don't have to do anything to help anybody. I don't have to do anything to stop oppression or injustice or human suffering because I'm just thinking love. There's nothing spiritual, nothing spiritual about that, nothing high-minded about that. There is no legitimate, serious spiritual path that ever makes you feel like you have a pass. You get a pass on addressing the suffering of other living things. What are some things you do to maintain your presence? Well, I'm a student of A Course in Miracles. There are many, many serious spiritual paths on this planet. Some of them are religious, some of them are spiritual, some of them are pretty secular. It, it, it doesn't matter the language. Um, if it's in a secular, if it's in a spiritual or religious uh, context, it will by definition involve uh, daily prayer and meditation. Because the idea here is that the consciousness of the human race is dominated by fear. And so enlightenment is an unlearning of the thought system of fear. And accepting instead the thought system that's actually natural to us, which is that we love each other and we want to connect. But we're taught from the time we were born on this planet, we're taught we're separate from each other, that there are only so, there's only so much abundance, so we have to compete to get some, which is what that book, Law of Divine Compensation, is about, rather than converting to the thought system that there's more than enough for everybody. And if you get the goods, it's not like there's less than me. So for me to just bless you, if I don't, if I don't rejoice that you have got abundance, then what I'm programming my mind to self-sabotage any time abundance comes to me. Because once I realize there's only one of us here, if I begrudge you, I'll begrudge myself. So you walk around knowing that there's enough for everybody. But this is more than an intellectual shift. You're more, it's more than a rational shift because it's so at odds. So it really is a retraining process. Just like you, you go to the gym to work your muscles and you do accumulate, let's say I'm working my arms, okay? And I have to do accumulated repetitions. Why? Because after a certain age, my muscles are headed down. Okay, so I have to use, you know, I work against gravity for the anti-gravitational force. That's how you build your physical muscles so that you can move. Spiritual exercise is the opposite. You're working, you're working on your capacity to be still. 
you, you are working, so you do spiritual exercises, forgiveness, compassion work, meditation, prayer, transcendental meditation, mean, there's so many here in, in this part of the country, I mean, they're, they're everywhere, different, and if you don't know, many people are in a position where you know what your spiritual path is, but you know you haven't been doing it. A lot of people with their spiritual paths are kind of like, I paid the dues at the gym, I just don't go. Other people in this room might be thinking, I don't even know what mine would be. If you and your heart make a movement towards, I'd be interested, books will fall at your feet. Okay? And then when we do that, we're honing our attitudinal muscles. We're honing our attitudinal muscles so that if I, if I, if I see you and I see something, I'd be tempted to judge, I don't judge, or if I do judge, I stop and go, oh. And then the interesting thing about that is whereas physical musculature gives you the, you can move, you can move, Spiritual musculature, attitudinal musculature, gives you the capacity to be still. You have impulse control. You don't say that stupid thing. You don't send that dumb text. You don't push the send button when my God, you know. Technology has really given us more power to blow it, you know, because I'm going to tell him right now, no, don't send that text, right? All that, right? Right? We have we Pardon? We have unused send at Google. Good, Chats. good, good. Yeah, I know, but then it doesn't it say, then it says that you undid something so the person knows that you undid Centered. I've been there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I know what you were going to say. Okay. So, but the other thing about that stillness is not only impulse control, but the wisdom mind can get through the clutter. There's a term in both uh, Judaism and Christianity, the small, still voice within. We meditate because the ego mind, the voice of the world, speaks first and it speaks loudest. And we meditate to cultivate a capacity for a wisdom voice. Um, it's that feeling of, oh, I just got this great idea. I, just, I got it. I'm sure that happens here at Google every day, in various places. Somebody said, oh my God, I got it. Well, hundreds of years ago, they would have said, the muse spoke to them. It's the same thing. You know, I, I, this relates a little bit, uh, but it was fascinating to me. Uh, I read an article in the newspaper about a bunch of brain scientists from MIT and Harvard and all over, some of the greatest brain scientists, who got together and they were having a meeting about Alzheimer's. Well, not specifically Alzheimer's, about memory loss in older people. And they were working on a theory. And this theory was the idea that not all memory loss is a devolutionary uh, factor in the functioning of the brain but rather they were talking about the idea that as the brain gets older, in its genius, it would say, I don't need any more of those details. I got the pattern. I don't, need, I don't need those details. I already jumped to the higher understanding of what the pattern is. And all these brain uh, scientists were all excited about this. Everybody at the table was talking about it because they were all getting it and they were all recognizing this and really turned on by this idea that there's something in the brain that seems to be weaker but is actually stronger and it said to drop the details for a reason because it's recognizing the higher patterns and they're all like excited and somebody said, oh my God, what do we call this? This is amazing, what do we call this? And all of a sudden it was just silence because everybody got it at the same time. Somebody threw up their pencil and went, wisdom. And that's what we're after, but we don't uh, have time to wait till we're old to be wise. Thank you. I want to know, you, when you talk about the law of uh, divine compens yes. compensation and you compare it with the law of gravity, there must be some strong conviction that you have that that's a real law that has some uh, basis for its functioning and, and you have convinced yourself that that uh, really exists and may perhaps some mechanism by which it works. Right. So I wonder if you, if you could give us some of that insight by which you believe that this is a, a true law that can be The trusted. only arbiter of that conviction is experience. And I can't give that to you. So I would say to you, for instance, oh, why don't you try it sometime, just in case. Now, conviction is a force multiplier. So if I, a lot of people, for instance, there might be some people in this room who, let's say, have been through recovery, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. There are many times, <clears throat> I, I always say in my work, people don't come to me because things are going well. Um, oftentimes when things are going well in people's uh, lives, they listen to people like me and think we're a bunch of woo-woo crazy people. But then they get diagnosed with cancer or their child is on heroin or their wife goes through 
uh, rehab or they get divorced or whatever. And there's something that happens when we're like on our knees and we're willing to hear things that maybe we were not interested in hearing before. And then we recognize, because it cannot not happen, whether it's the Course in Miracles or, or uh, 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, these steps cannot not work any more than when you go to the gym. I mean, if you do it, it's going to work. If I do enough leg lifts, my thighs are going to change. It's, it's going to not not work. You don't say that I have such faith in the gym. I just know how it works. If you go through enough in your own life where you feel you really messed up and you tried to be a better person, you tried to clean things up, you tried to be more loving, you took responsibility for your life, you made amends where you needed to, you apologized for it, you try to be more integrous, you try to be more responsible, you try to be more reliable, your life changes. And then it's not just that you believe it, it's that you, you experience it. Belief doesn't mean anything. And there are people who say they believe in God and kill people in the name of God. And there are people who don't even believe in God, but they love each other and they stand on love. So they're conspiring with divinity even if they don't yet believe in it. It's not about belief, it's about experience. So where do I get my conviction? My experience. You know, people once, yeah, that my conviction, my life. I notice that when I do my best to practice what I preach, my life really works. And when I don't practice what I preach, those are the moments when I experience chaos, disorder, and unhappiness. So I'm pretty convinced. <laughs> Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you. And for the inspiration you bring to the world. Thank you. And, and I think you already answered my question about prisons, but the question is more more about how do you deprogram yourself from fear to love, from scarcity to abundance? Okay. Uh, enlightenment, the Course in Miracles says enlightenment begins as an abstract intellectual construct. We all know these principles by now, love, compassion, blah, blah, blah. But that is so counter to the thinking of the world. It's easy to sit in a room talking about how we should all love each other. It's when we go out of this room that life is a constant temptation. So the spiritual journey is, a, is the abstraction taking the journey from the head to the heart. And that is what that attitudinal, we're honing, you're honing new attitudinal muscles. And just like with the physical gym, the repetitions, the accumulated repetitions of that which opposes gravity, after a certain age, whether it's your physical muscles or your thought forms, if you're not working on keeping them up, they're headed down and you accumulated repetitions, and that's what a sp serious spiritual path is, and that's what meditation is, and that's what prayer is. I'm a student of the Course in Miracles. The Course does not claim to be for everybody. If it's for you, you know it. Um, there, there is some path for everybody. Uh, there are the world's great religions that have, oh, they all have their mystical teachings, which are at the core, you know, separate from the organized, dogma and doctrine, uh, there are meditation paths, every person, there is, like I said, if you're, if you're interested in it, it'll occur to you, it'll be at somebody's house, it'll be a book on the floor, whatever. But it does take daily practice, and I think that a very important issue that's also very similar to physical exercise, you never get to a point where you've done so much physical exercise that you look in the mirror and go, cool, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> On any day that you stop doing it, the muscles will head back down. And the same until you're, I guess, the level of the avatar, the enlightened master or something, which I'm not, so I can't know. But I know at the level beneath that, the fact that you did it yesterday doesn't mean you don't have to do it today. Because today will be a whole new set of temptations. And the higher you get, right, the higher the study. So the way life operates, in my experience, and everybody I know is, hey, you're doing really well. God, that was really nice, the way you handled that. It was really great. You were really dignified, elegant, wise. <laughs> How's that? Because it comes from left field, you get triggered. And then you go later, oh. But you know, in a real spiritual journey, the word try is not a bad word. You know, we all fall off the spiritual wagon. We say things, we do things, not our best moments. We get up, and uh, even that becomes part of what teaches us, because we really want to do it better next time, and life will always give us the opportunity. 
But that's where the whole idea of atonement comes in. The atonement principle is an amazing principle that you get a cosmic reset. When you admit what you've done wrong, you, take it, you, take it, you acknowledge, you take responsibility for your mistakes. And then, you know, this is where in, in, in the religious narrative, this is where Buddha came 500 years before Jesus. Buddha talked about action has a reaction, every action has a reaction. And then Jesus said, yes, but in a moment of grace, the karma is burned. So the Eastern religions are real into the, the recognition that every action has a reaction. Every thought creates form at some level. Every thought determines how you will then behave. Every action will have a consequence. And that is, that is the great gift of the Eastern perspective. The Western perspective is, and I can do something about it if I don't like that. That I can, that I can interrupt the pattern of karma through atonement, through recognizing the mistake I made, through asking forgiveness through whatever the practice is. And that's really where, and, and whole nations get, uh, get, uh, need atonement sometimes, just like, uh, just like individuals do. And that's very much where the United States is. You know, Germany really, uh, you have to give it to Germany. I mean, Germany flat out owned it. And I, I say that as a Jew, so Jews are very aware of that. They owned it. From the reparations to the, to the museums to the everything, they owned it. And that, I think, from a metaphysical perspective, is one of the reasons why Germany is doing so well today. The universe supported it. The United States, for whatever reason, ha takes this corporate never apologize, never, never explain, and never apologize, terrible. But whether it has to do with our refusal to apologize for slavery, our refusal to apologize for Vietnam, our refusal, for refusal to apologize for Iraq, we, we, we won't allow ourselves, as individuals we will. But the nation has some terrible karma because of this infantile belief that if I accept responsibility, I'm somehow, that that's weakness. When in fact, spiritually, for an individual and for a nation, that's strength. Um, thank you so much for coming today. You come up in my life outside of work, and it's really special to have you here at thank work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I just I wanted to actually ask about your experience of integrating or speaking this language in, in environments or communities kind of where the language isn't spoken. Okay. How do you <clears throat> practice that? Well, what is your experience? Well, so been? much has changed in the last 30 years. I mean, when I started my career, you know, people would hear the things I was saying and go, oh my God, I've never even heard these things, I've never even thought about these things. Today, people go, oh, that's exactly what we were talking about yesterday, that's so interesting. It has become a mainstream conversation. Now, your friends, if you can't talk it, <laughs> now you're like, you know, so, and then whether you talk about it in spiritual terms or secular terms is not that difficult because it's just about love, it's about compassion. So for people for whom the word God would seem like a freak, you don't use the word God. God himself doesn't care. It's just a word. It's love. It's the experience of our loving each other. Like in, that, in, in Les Miserables where it says to love another person is to see the face of God. So more and more I find it uh, easier and easier because it's really hit a tipping point in the culture. It's, it's, it's mainstream, which is, I think, a very good thing. Does that make sense? Don't you find that? Finding yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, sometimes we have to just change. If you can't drop your jargon, then you're not deep enough into the inquiry anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I was curious. I recently started learning about Viktor Frankl and yes. the therapy. Yes. And he talks about the purpose or meaning in life. Yeah. So I wonder how much of that had an experience or not. Uh, influence, I meant, on your thoughts or not? Very much so, of course, as I think it's a classic in anybody's development of this understanding. Um, there's only one truth spoken in many different, different ways. And I think Viktor Frankl is one of those people who, because of his own personal experience and his own personal suffering, uh, has had tremendous, obviously, moral authority and effect <laughs> on generations. And yes, he has been on mine. As there's nothing like someone who's been there and says, this stuff works. Thank you so much for Thank you. Coming. God bless you everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.